Sitting all by myself in the darkness All I see are the dark clouds rising Seems there's no one around who hears me Who understands, understands But then I hear you say My name is Jesus I'll help to see you through My name is Jesus And I Good morning, and welcome to Prince of Peace Lutheran Church in Thousand Oaks, California. I'm Pastor Noah Bader, and it is my privilege to bring the Word of God to you and your family this morning. Throughout the summer, we will be following the ministry of Jesus as it is recorded in the Gospel of Matthew. And for the next two Sundays, we'll listen in as Jesus encourages his newly chosen disciples, prior to sending them out on their first mission trip, so to speak. So what would Jesus say? Well, three times today we will hear Jesus say the words, Don't be afraid. And if you've ever shared your faith or tried to share your faith with someone, you know exactly why Jesus spoke those words multiple times. Because it's a scary thing. Jesus says, people will reject you, the world will hate you, and that's exactly what it feels like. But Jesus will also give us a number of reasons this morning for why it is that we can not be afraid as we take that precious message of Jesus Christ and the forgiveness of sins and we boldly share it with everyone we know. Maybe you heard the unfortunate news this past week. The state of California and our governor have asked all churches throughout the state to temporarily stop singing in public worship services. There's a number of studies you can look up online. It comes from the CDC and the California Public Health Department. But we will comply uh, somewhat begrudgingly because as Lutherans, we are a singing church. It's what we do. It's what we love. Um, and yet we will do that um, for a time being in our public worship services. But since you're worshiping at home or wherever it is you're worshiping from, uh, we will continue to include uh, the songs and the hymns and the psalms in our online worship service. And so even people who are here um, on Sunday morning, they'll have that in their service folder and they can go home and sing those hymns uh, as a family together. Finally, this morning, we want to wish everyone a happy 4th of July weekend. Um, we'll include uh, a prayer for our nation this morning, and what a fitting time to do that, not only because of the 4th of July, but obviously because of so many things that are going on around us. We'll ask our Lord to, to bless our nation, to continue to uh, give us the ability to enjoy and cherish the liberties that we have. Most uh, importantly the ability to do the very thing that Jesus will be calling and encouraging and equipping us to do today, and that is to take that message of the gospel to everyone we can for as much time as we have. The order of service that will follow is printed in the, the service folder. It's found at the link um, below this, uh, this video. You can find it there if you'd like to follow along, and we'll begin on page three with the invocation. May the Lord be with us and bless us this morning. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins and trusting in my Savior Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, 
Have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Father in heaven, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the peace of this forgiveness, let us sing to the Lord. God, govern the nations on earth and direct the affairs of this world so that your church may worship you in peace and joy. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first scripture reading is recorded in the Old Testament book of Jeremiah chapters 19 and 20. Here, the Lord's prophet is called to preach an unpopular message, and he suffers the consequences for it as he is beaten and thrown in prison. And yet when he is released, the Lord calls him again, go back and preach. And he does, for the Lord is with him. Jeremiah then returned from Topheth, where the Lord had sent him to prophesy, and stood in the court of the Lord's temple, and said to all the people, This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Listen, I am going to bring on this city and the villages around it every disaster I pronounced against them, because they were stiff-necked and would not listen to my words. When the priest Pashur, son of Immer, the chief officer in the temple of the Lord, heard Jeremiah prophesying these things, he had Jeremiah the prophet beaten and put in the stocks at the upper gate of Benjamin at the Lord's temple. The next day, when Pashur released him from the stocks, Jeremiah said to him, The Lord's name for you is not Pashur, but Magor Misabib. For this is what the Lord says, I will make you a terror to yourself 
and to all your friends. With your own eyes you will see them fall by the sword of their enemies. I will hand all Judah over to the king of Babylon, who will carry them away to Babylon or put them to the sword. I will hand over to their enemies all the wealth of this city, all its products, all its valuables, and all the treasures of the kings of Judah. They will take it away as plunder and carry it off to Babylon. And you, Pashur, and all who live in your house will go into exile to Babylon. And there you will die and be buried, you and all your friends to whom you have prophesied lies. The word of the Lord. second scripture reading is recorded in the New Testament book of Acts, chapter 23. 
Here we encounter the Apostle Paul as he is on trial yet again for his life. And yet not even a martyr's death would stop Paul from proclaiming Christ crucified. Paul looked straight at the Sanhedrin and said, My brothers, I have fulfilled my duty to God in all good conscience to this day. At this, the high priest Ananias ordered those standing near Paul to strike him on the mouth. And Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. You sit there to judge me according to the law, yet you yourself violate the law by commanding that I be struck. Those who were standing near Paul said, You dare to insult God's high priest? Paul replied, Brothers, I did not realize that he was the high priest. For it is written, Do not speak evil about the ruler of your people. Then Paul, knowing that some of them were Sadducees and the others Pharisees, called out in the Sanhedrin, My brothers, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. I stand on trial because of my hope in the resurrection of the dead. When he said this, a dispute broke out between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. The Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, and that there are neither angels nor spirits, but the Pharisees acknowledge them all. There was a great uproar, and some of the teachers of the law who were Pharisees stood up and argued vigorously. We find nothing wrong with this man, they said. What if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him? The dispute became so violent that the commander was afraid Paul would be torn to pieces by them. He ordered the troops to go down and take him away from them by force and bring him into the barracks. The following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, Take courage. As you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel appointed for the fifth Sunday after the festival of Pentecost is recorded in the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 10. These words will serve as the basis for our sermon today. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. A student is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the student to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. If the head of the house has been called Beelzebub, how much more the members of his household? So do not be afraid of them. There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, Proclaim from the roofs. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of your Father. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Whoever acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before men, I will disown him before my Father in heaven. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. We confess our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven. 
and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My dear sisters and brothers in Christ, did you know this? Do not be afraid appears 365 times in the Bible. It's a daily reminder from God to live every day without fear. See that floating around the internet. Have you caught this? Yeah. It's such a beautiful sentiment, isn't it? If only it were true. Now, with all the different translations of the Bible and the numerous variations of this phrase, uh, like fear not and do not fear and don't be anxious and don't be dismayed and don't worry, if, if you add all them up, you, you might be able to get somewhere close to 365. But the the absolute most that I could find in any English translation for that specific phrase, do not be afraid, was 131. I guess the other quote I saw on the internet is also true. It came from Abraham Lincoln. Don't believe everything you read on the internet. Now, so as to not completely crush your love for this phrase, this one is true. 
do not be afraid, is the most frequently used command in the Bible. And it's not even close. It's not love or repent or even obey. The most commonly spoken command in Scripture is don't be afraid. And if you think about it, it really makes sense. I mean, consider the entirety of Scripture. Everything that God's Word seeks to do, instill, and communicate. And you'd be hard-pressed to come up with a better summary of it all than don't be afraid. I mean, it only takes us, what, two chapters of getting into the Bible to be immediately confronted with humanity's colossal problem with fear. Adam and Eve disobey God. They prefer the word of the serpent over the word of their gracious creator. And what is their instant reaction? They realized they were naked and they were afraid. Fear is now a part of our everyday life. Whether you're facing your fears or you're fleeing from your fears, fear affects everything you do. It's there when you get up in the morning. The fear of what to do about your health. Fear about your job, about your marriage, about your kids, about if you're ever going to get married, about if you're ever going to have kids. It's there when you go to bed at night. Fear about failure, or whether or not you accomplished enough that day, or whether you're going to wake up with the coronavirus in the morning, or whether you're going to wake up in the morning at all. There are literally countless things we could talk about this morning, things that cause you fear. But Jesus addresses one specific fear in our text this morning, one that I think we all can identify with. The fear of sharing the message of the gospel. The message of Jesus Christ for sinners with the world. Forget the world. With your spouse, with your kids, with your parents, with your family, with your friends, with your co-workers, with your neighbor, with the person who's sitting right next to you. As I mentioned at the beginning of the service, the the context here in Matthew chapter 10 is Jesus sending out his newly selected disciples on their first missionary journey. But before he sends them out, Jesus gives them a whole slew of instructions. For example, he tells them who their target audience will be. The lost sheep of Israel, Jesus says. Their own brothers and sisters, fellow Israelites. He outlines the content of what their message will be, what they're going to preach about. The kingdom of heaven is near. God has come close to be with his people. The Messiah has come. He promises them that that they will be provided for on their journey. Jesus said, don't take any gold or silver with you. The Lord will make sure you have everything you need. And finally, Jesus explains what to do when people welcome them into their home and when people don't. All relatively straightforward instructions. Uh, Largely, I I would assume, the disciples were all expecting and on board with. It's everything that you would anticipate hearing before heading out on a mission trip. But then Jesus concludes all of those opening instructions with this. This is earlier in Matthew 10. Jesus said, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. I got to assume that that probably was not expected. And then Jesus follows it up with our text for this morning and says, don't be afraid, don't be afraid, don't be afraid. And eventually you get to the point where you say, hey, stop telling me to not be afraid. It's making me afraid. I mean, a sheep being afraid of a wolf seems like a pretty reasonable reaction, Jesus. But Jesus explains why they don't need to fear. 
A student is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the student to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. Easy enough. I don't know that any of the disciples would have raised any rebuttals. It's all pretty logical. A student is not above his teacher. Students learn under a teacher. Students shouldn't expect to teach the teacher. They're the students. And likewise, a a servant is not above his master. A servant takes orders from his master. He serves under his master. A servant shouldn't expect to give orders to his master. All of that makes sense. But do you understand the connection that Jesus is making here between himself and his disciples, between himself and us? Jesus is the teacher. We are the students. Jesus is the master. We are the servants. Jesus says, it is enough for the student to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. Jesus says, it's enough for you to be like me. But understand that Jesus is referencing likeness in a very, very specific way. He he goes on to clarify this. He says, if the head of the house has been called Beelzebub, a name for the devil, how much more the members of his household? Jesus says, the world is going to grossly mistreat me. They are going to persecute me, call me names, and physically abuse me. Jesus says, it is enough if you are treated like I am. If they beat up the teacher, you should expect to receive the same beating as his students. If they mock and ridicule the master, they'll mock and ridicule his servants. If the world did this to Jesus, then you should expect it to do the same to you, dear Christian. And Jesus says, that is enough. That's what it will be like when you go and share your faith. Nothing more, nothing less than what I endured. So the question is, is that enough for you? Is it enough for you to be treated the way Jesus was treated? In other words, are you good with that? No. Don't we so often want more? Isn't that why we don't share our faith and why we conceal the fact that we're Christians from others around us? Oh, we come up with really nice sounding excuses, don't we? Oh, I don't want to offend anyone or, you know, Jesus, I, I don't want to ruin the family get-together by, by being that oddball who's always bringing up religion. But the reality is, we just don't want to suffer the potential negative consequences sharing the gospel often brings. I don't want to be mocked, but Jesus was. I don't want to be labeled as one of those. They called Jesus the devil. I don't want to lose my friends. We're told Jesus once lost like 20,000 followers in one afternoon. Oh, and really his only true friends, his closest friends, his disciples, they all abandoned him in his hour of most need. I don't want to be ostracized from my family. Jesus' family called him crazy. I don't want people to think less of me. They thought so little of Jesus that they stripped him completely nude and hung him from a tree. The reality is, you want more than Jesus got. You want to be treated better than Jesus was treated. And so when Jesus says, it is enough for you to be like me, we respond, but Jesus... We're having such a nice family get-together. And I haven't seen my kids in so long. And I finally have a neighbor that I like, and, and I think he actually might be the one. And I don't want to risk it. 
I don't want to risk her or him or them. I don't want to ruin any of it by, well, by bringing up you, Jesus. We fear people more than we fear God. We fear what they can take from us, and we fear what they can do to us. But don't expect any sympathy from Jesus in that regard. Rather, Jesus wants you to know how foolish of an approach to life that is. Do not be afraid of those who can kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. It's a popular tattoo and social media slogan or hashtag, not just with young people. I once had an 89-year-old man say it to me. Only God can judge me. It's meant to be the ultimate trump card that would shut down anything that someone might say to you in reference to your actions or your character or your motives or your ethics. Only God can judge me, certainly not you. As if God is the better option. As if God is the easier judge. I'd rather roll the dice with God than with people. You can fool people. You will not fool God. People, hey, they can only kill you. And while I realize that is not an insignificant thing, when compared to an eternal death of body and soul that never ends, And if we think that eternal death is way beyond anything we would ever deserve, Jesus concludes our text by saying this, Whoever disowns me before men, I will disown him before my Father in heaven. Well, that's easy. I would never disown Jesus. Sure, I might prefer to keep him in the back pocket of my life, tucked safely away where no one else can see him, and and, and maybe bring him out when times are convenient, you know, like on a Sunday morning, when I'm not around any of my friends or family members or neighbors. But honestly, it's just not enough for me to be like him, to suffer like Jesus. I do want more. I want better but I would never disown Jesus. And maybe you're right. Maybe disown does seem a little strong. Honestly, I I can't envision any of you disowning Jesus. But the word that Jesus actually uses here, the word that is translated disown, it's a word that just simply means to say no. Literally, Jesus says, whoever says no to me before men, I will say no to him before my Father in heaven. Would you ever say no to Jesus? What about if he said, it is enough for you to be like me? Yes or no? Here's the sad irony. All of those things that we long for from people, you know, the reasons we hide Jesus in the secret places of our lives, the things we long for like love and companionship, friendship, acceptance and joy, people will only give those things to you so long as you give them a reason to. For example, you ever been replaced as a friend by someone who was cooler than you? Or maybe someone who was prettier than you? Or someone who had more money than you? (laughs) I've heard from people that friendships have ended over something as stupid as, I I forgot to say happy birthday to them on their Facebook page. Or or maybe you said something about your new neighbor, a neighbor that you like, but you said something about him behind his back to your other neighbor, and it got back to your new neighbor, 
And now the awkwardness between you is so bad that you're just hoping that your new neighbor quickly becomes your old neighbor. <laughs> We're such fickle people. The irony is all those things we long for will never perfectly get from people. But all of them and more are perfectly given and eternally promised to us in Christ. We want friendship and acceptance. So we find people who will give those things to us. But despite the fact that we say secrets don't make friends, you have secrets that you've kept from your friends. And I know we all claim to have that one friend who knows everything about us, but if we're being completely honest, that's probably not entirely true. Because if someone knew everything about you, chances are they wouldn't want to be your friend, and you know it. But if acceptance and friendship is what you're looking for, there's no better place to look than Jesus. The one who literally does know every last secret about you. He even knows things about you that you don't know about yourself. Like apparently how many hairs are on your head. He is the one from whom nothing in your life is hidden. And, and, he is the one who will one day share all things with you. This is why Jesus says there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. The questions you have, the wrestling you've done in your life, the struggle to find answers as to why this happened or where was God when that happened. Jesus says one day I'll, I'll tell you all of it. I'll share it all with you one day. Because that's what friends do. We want love and attention. But every single one of us has been hurt by, has been burned by love. And therefore left starved for more attention. We've been hurt, betrayed, abandoned. Which is why we're still always clamoring for love. So if you're looking for love and attention, Jesus says, look to your Father in heaven. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of your Father. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Wow. Okay. Thanks, God. I'm worth more than a couple birds. Understand what Jesus is doing here. He's making a common logical argument from the lesser to the greater. Here's how it works. Sparrows were what poor people ate. Jesus says you could get two for a penny, but what he literally says is that you can buy a couple of these birds for one-sixteenth of a day's wage. It was the cheapest meat you could buy. They were far from being a delicacy. In the eyes of society, they were worthless birds that no one really ever thought about. They were what you and I would call a dime a dozen. But Jesus says, God the Father is constantly thinking about these birds. In fact, God thinks about them so frequently and knows so much about every single sparrow on earth that nothing happens to any of them without God knowing it and allowing it to happen. And if that's the kind of love and attention that God gives to the lesser, to these dime a dozen birds, brothers and sisters, how much more care, how much more love, how much more attention do you think God gives to you, the greater, in his eyes, the greatest? the crown of his creation, his dear children who are worth far more to him than a ton of birds. My goodness, he even gave his son over into death for you, not for the birds. 
just for you. Only you mean that much to him. Finally, Jesus says, whoever acknowledges me, I will also acknowledge him. How could we not acknowledge Jesus? I mean, we acknowledge everything we love. We can't even go sit down and have a meal at a nice restaurant without sharing it online with everyone we know. So how about this? Let's start simple. Just check in that you were here this morning on one of your social media pages. Even if you're watching online, just acknowledge to your friends, your family, your neighbors, your coworkers that you spent the morning with Jesus. We visit someplace beautiful. We have to take a picture of it, and we have to share that with everybody we know. Have you shared any of these videos with someone who might benefit from them? Acknowledge that Jesus gave you the peace and the comfort that you needed to get through that day and acknowledging that someone you know and love might need the same? How could we not acknowledge Jesus? Who knows you better than Jesus? And despite what he knows, who has loved you like Jesus? Who has sacrificed more for you than Jesus? Who has gone to greater lengths for you than Jesus? Whose attention is on you like God's is day after day without fail, assuring you that you are never alone? I mean, can you imagine what the sparrows must sing about God, their creator, their provider, their protector, how much more will you have to say about him? Your savior, your redeemer, your friend. What I tell you in the dark, Jesus says, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roofs. How could you not? Brothers and sisters, we share our faith not because we want to win an argument or because we want to prove to people that we picked the right religion. We share Jesus because all those things that you and I long for in life, those are all the same things. Your family, your neighbors, your friends, your coworkers, everyone you know longs for those same things. And without Jesus, you wouldn't have any of them. And without Jesus, neither will they. Fear not. You know, as I was searching that phrase this week, I stumbled across an internet forum where someone had actually asked this very question. Is, don't be afraid, really in the Bible, 300 and 65 times. And most of the replies were these long explanations and breakdowns of different verses and phrases and translations and and a list and account of all of them. And while helpful, the one answer that I kept coming back to again and again, the one that I think answered the question best was the shortest answer of them all is don't be afraid really in the Bible 365 times. Someone simply wrote, you know, I don't know. But hearing Jesus say it just once is enough for me. And it really is. It's enough. That's what you have with Jesus everything you need, including every reason to fearlessly share everything he's given you and everything he's done for you and everything he has in store for those around you.
So don't be afraid, my friends. In the name of Jesus, amen. My name is Jesus. I'll help to see you through. My name is Jesus. And I have promised you. We continue with the prayer of the church. Merciful Lord, hear the prayers of your people and grant to us grace sufficient for our needs and all those for whom we pray. Our God and King, as once your people received you in joy, Open our hearts to rejoice in your coming, so that we may meet you in your word and sacrament for the forgiveness of our sins and the strengthening of our faith. Help us to bless and extol your name before the nations and to declare your salvation to the generations to come, proclaiming that you are merciful and gracious and abounding in steadfast love. Make bold our witness before the nations and help us to act always in love toward our neighbors. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Our eternal Father, ruler of all nations, as we celebrated our country's birth yesterday, we thank you for all spiritual and temporal blessings enjoyed in our land. In your mercy, you have sustained this nation in times of trouble, and preserved its liberties. Teach us again to especially treasure those dearly won freedoms of conscience and worship, which are the cornerstones of this country's principles. Let us not misuse these liberties, nor forget that true freedom is the freedom to serve others. Give us a willingness to be productive citizens, to respect our country's laws, and to work for the preservation of its institutions. Forgive our past sins committed as a nation in the name of misguided patriotism, self-interest, or political expediency. Grant wisdom to our leaders. Strengthen all those who strive to do your will. Protect us and our fellow citizens from all subversive or terrorist attacks. Above all, dear God, speed the course of your gospel among us so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, hearts are turned to that freedom from sin and death that you alone graciously give through Jesus Christ our Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Our compassionate Lord, we do not suffer alone the pain and afflictions of this life, but we live them out within your grace and are sustained by your mercy. Hear us on behalf of the sick, those who suffer, the grieving, and those to whom death is near. According to your will, deliver them from their afflictions and give to all your strength, patience, and hope that they may endure to eternal life. Show compassion and drive all pestilence from our land. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Our loving Father, you have hidden your greatness from our wisdom and made your ways known to children. Guide us to bring our children to the waters of baptism, to raise them up in the fear and admonition of the Lord, and to know perfect rest and peace within your loving arms. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Our gentle God and Lord, you have invited us to come to you with the heavy burdens of this life, that we may find rest and peace in your mercy. Grant relief to those who struggle. Supply to those in need. Hope to those who fear. And peace to those who are anxious, 
that we may be delivered from all adversity and brought to everlasting life, where we shall join the saints of old in your presence forevermore. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All these things, blessed Lord, we pray you to grant us according to your merciful goodness and for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. This ocean, mighty billows roll. It's my hope in Jesus, the anchor of my soul. When trials of life surround me, 
storms are gathering on I rest upon his mercy and trust him more I reckon in Jesus, storms of life I'll breath I reckon in Jesus, I feel no wind away I reckon in Jesus, he has power to 